Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Martin O'Reilly. I'm Director of Research Engineering at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. And at the Turing, I run the Research Engineering Group, which is a central team of research software engineers, research data scientists, and research computing engineers uh, who work with researchers across the Institute's programs to uh, support their research by producing robust reusable code, uh, trustworthy reproducible analytics pipelines and flexible and reliable compute infrastructure. Uh, also along with my colleagues James Robinson, Kirsty Whitaker and James Hethington, I co-lead the Turing's Data Safe Haven project which is what I'm going to talk about today. So um, Let's just take the temperature of the room uh, before I start. Sort of, how many of you have heard of a trusted research environment or a data safe haven? Okay, a lot. How many have used one? Okay, fewer. And, and how many have sort of administrated or, or, or been involved in building one? Okay, even fewer. Okay, so I think, I think we're probably uh, pitched right. So I'm going to talk about sort of three things. I'm going to talk about why. We're, we're sort of doing the work, both why do we need trusted research environments and, and why did we build one ourselves at the Turing. I'm going to talk about the what, so you know, for us our, our data safe haven is a secure, scalable, uh, reproducibly deployable cloud-based trusted research environment for working safely with sensitive data. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the how, which in many ways is kind of deeper version of the, of the why. Uh, so, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, why is openness and, and collaboration so important in making sure that we sort of break down silos and, and we don't keep doing the same work in lots of different places and that we can do this in a way that lets us all as a community build on the work of others and adopt and adapt some common things to, to solve our common problems. And why doing this in a, in a sort of inclusive and, and, and sort of open manner is, is sort of critical for success. So in sort of summary for us, our data safe haven is here to remove barriers for working safely and effectively with sensitive data by promoting and demonstrating a, a culture of open community-led development for interoperable foundational infrastructure and governance. And, and I'm going to sort of get into the meat of it now. So why do we need the data safe haven or you know, trusted research environments in general? Well, the core of the, the issue is we want to do effective research on, on sensitive data. Well, we want to do that while keeping the data safe and maintaining public confidence, both of those people who are charged with looking after the data, the people who are represented within the data and, and the public at large. And we see this problem sort of in many domains and in many types of data. So health is a big one and where a lot of the work's been done sort of up to now. You know, all of our health records are some of the most sensitive things about us, but understanding sort of the data and the insights we can gain from those is sort of critical to ensuring that we can support people through better health. Um, our finance data, and for finance, it's not just sort of personal data. The banks have a duty to know their customer, to catch fraud. Um, the data could be used to sort of inform monitoring of economic activity. Um, but moving this together, you know, it has concerns for us who are represented in the data, but also for the banks sharing this with their competitors is, you know, has a, has a um, commercial sensitivity as well. Uh, a lot of government data is, is, is super sensitive. The government knows a lot about us and actually it's quite careful about not grouping that data together even operationally and that can be a challenge for it. And one of the most interesting use cases we've had discussions with is sort of pop-up trusted research environments to allow government organisations to pool data together in a way that doesn't permanently transfer it from one department to another. And other types of data like location data, you know, you can try anonymizing location data by adding some noise, but if you sort of look at where you generally tend to be and average over time, you'll probably find your home and your work and maybe your favorite social location. And in order to kind of work safely with sensitive data, we can broadly do one of two things. We can make the data safer and there's, there's all sorts of ways we can do that. We can summarize it and, you know, we're used to publishing statistics, you know, and summary tables. There's enough information publicly available for us to probably work out our respective chances of a heart attack in this room, and it won't be the same for all of us. And that's okay. As a society, 
we, we don't consider that a breach of our personal data. We can anonymize it, so we can move direct identifiers like names and you know, national insurance numbers, maybe things like telephone numbers that are one-to-one -one mapped to us as individuals. But there's also other sort of indirect identifiers that it's important to sort of be careful about um, that can allow individuals to be re-identified, especially when combined with other data. We can sample the data. This is quite effective for commercial sensitivity, but can also give plausible deniability for personal data. If you've got a, you know, something that's much, much smaller than the entire data set, then maybe it's enough with a bit of anonymization that you can't prove I'm in the data set, or that if that data made it out on the internet, a company's entire business model wouldn't be blown up. The other thing we can do broadly is perturb the data. A really common way to do this is to kind of bucket things up, so your age to the nearest 10 years rather than your date of birth. Um, but sometimes for outliers, you can also mix and match things, so the statistics are still legit, but individual records don't match closely to individual people in reality. Sometimes outliers just need to be removed, right? You can't safely make those outliers non-identifying without wrecking the rest of the data, the amount of noise or, or perturbation or other things you'll need to do. And more recently, there's approaches to synthesizing data. So you can learn some properties of the data. You can then reproduce an entirely synthetic version of the data from those properties that we've decided are some version of sort of safe summaries of the data. Um, and if you need to look a bit more closely at the data, there are also methods like differential privacy that would allow you to do that in a way that provides some, some personal protection. But generally speaking, we want to do effective research on, on, on this data. And most of the ways, techniques that we'd need to use to make data safe enough to be out on the internet, or even on our laptops, just controlled by us saying we promise not to, not to do anything bad with it, doesn't make the data providers and the people in the data and society as a whole comfortable that that data is protected well enough. And so we almost always need to control access as well. And, and that's sort of where trusted research environments come in. And these are a highly, you know, highly secure computational analysis environments where approved subsets of researchers can carry out approved research using sensitive data. The idea is we can mess with the data just enough so that it's not easily identifiable within that environment but with those other controls, we're, we're comfortable that the risk to, of re-identification or the commercial risk is low, and we can actually effectively bring that data together. Um, most of these environments are based on some version of the five safes. So the first and most important one is safe projects. We're about to pick up some data that's sensitive. Is it worth doing at all? Are we likely to find an answer that's meaningful? Are we likely to find some benefit to society? Is it ethical? and sort of save people, you know, do the people working on the data, are they trained, do they have awareness of the risks, are they going to kind of look after the data and do their bit. Um, safe settings, so you know, the technical controls that, that we use to, to try and ensure that that data doesn't go anywhere it shouldn't and isn't accessed by people who shouldn't access it. Um, safe data, so this is about what comes in, so how do we make that data sort of safe enough that within that environment we're, we're comfortable operating it there and safe outputs, and this is sort of where we do need that full confidence that you know, going out to the internet or approved researchers' laptops or a government department or some other sort of less controlled environment, that those outputs are safe, and, and the bar for that's going to be much higher, and we'll almost certainly have to do some of that safer data stuff to, to, to make that true. And often, when people think of trusted research environments, they think of this technology bit in the middle. It's the technical environment, it's the technical controls, <coughs> sort of do everything else. But, but really, this all sort of works together. And it's a set of governance controls, it's a set of technical controls, and a set of statistical controls. And when we put them all together, we sort of get confidence that we're, you know, we're keeping the data safe enough that we can still do effective research with it. Um, and these last controls, the, the safe data and the safe outputs, especially the safe data, you know, in the original paper, they're, they're talked about as residual controls because they're destructive. Um, so we're losing information when we, when we make the data safer, and we're losing information when we sort of make our out published outputs safer. And so anything we can do with these other controls to sort of minimize the damage we need to do to the data to collectively make it safe within that environment allows us to do more effective research. And when we were 
looking around to when we started up to look at doing work with sensitive data. Um, sort of our context was, you know, it had some quirks that sort of made the existing uh, solutions not, not sort of very suited to us. And the first one's probably not, not a critical one, but actually we, we don't deal with that many long running projects with sensitive data. We've probably got five or 10 running at any point in time. So, you know, a system that we can sort of scale to meet, meet our kind of needs is important. And um, what we do have is a large number of these short, week-long data hackathons. And each of those has sort of four to six different challenges, each coming from a different data provider. They'll often be working with sensitive data that's either com almost always commercially sensitive, but may also be um, sensitive because it includes uh, data about individuals. And these require us to onboard about 70 people on the Monday morning um, who pick their project and then expect to be working productively on it in the afternoon and require us to rapidly support changes to the software, the sort of scale or the types of compute that people have access to. And so while we've only got a small number of ongoing projects, collectively over the course of a year or two, we have a huge number of data providers we have to interact with. Even if you expand that to people who we've been talking with but haven't picked a DSG, that gets even worse. And so for us, ensuring that we had some sort of consistent model for, for talking about risk with those data providers was really important. And both the, our long-term projects and our data study groups, because of the sort of institute we are, are generally have people trying to push the boundaries a bit on, on sort of applying methods. And um, that often means that they'll need to kind of install some non-standard tooling or some particular thing that they want to try out. Um, and they'll often need access to kind of big machines, lots of GPUs or lots of CPUs, large memory and um, huge data sets, but not all of the time. So again, that flexibility sort of matters as well. And we couldn't find one that sort of met our needs, so we, we built our own, but we were also frustrated that there wasn't already an open source community-driven solution to this that allowed people to sort of adopt it for themselves and adapt it for their context. And as a national institute, that's the kind of problem that we see sort of right, as right in our wheelhouse. You know, how can we solve a common problem once and for all? How can we enable the community and force multiply them to, to sort of have something that sort of raises the foundations of, of, of the, um, that they do their research on? So what is our data safe haven? Well, it's a sort of three strands. It's, it's a standardized governance. It's a way of talking with data providers about what the sensitivity of data means. It's a set of controls that we can tune to help provide confidence. It's an open infrastructure uh, that systematizes and, and, and that, that, that kind of governance and makes it easy for us to sort of robustly, reliably leverage it and allows others to adopt and adapt it for their use cases. And it's a collaborative community. It's so that, you know, how we can work together to sort of uh, understand what our common needs are for this and where, where, where our needs differ and, and how we can work together and go, and go further. So we'll start with the governance. So on the governance side, we've got a framework for classification to understand the safety of a combination of a project, what we're going to do with the data and the data itself. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about why we always consider those things together. Um, a sort of scale of flexible trainings uh, that are sort of accepted by the, the data providers that we use, but that we can tune to the sensitivity of the data. If it's just some commercially sensitive data, perhaps our institutional information, uh, sort of data protection and um, uh, IT security type training will suffice. If it's health related personal data, then there's some sort of accepted uh, trainings from the likes of the MRC and others. Um, it's, processes and policies for reviewing data that we use on ingress and reviewing the outputs that we sort of generate on egress to make sure that both of those are sufficiently safe. And it tries to bake in our governance into our infrastructure. So we've got a web application that supports our decision-making workflow for, for classifying combinations of both data and outputs. And we've got a flexibly uh, configured sort of infrastructure as code deployment that allows us to ensure that the safety of the setting is, is appropriate for the data 
and the work that we're doing, and we can tune that per project. So a, a key distinction for us in the way we think about things is so sort of thinking about work packages rather than data sets, where the work package is the combination of all of the data sets we're bringing together for a piece of work and the activity we're trying to sort of do on them, what we're trying, you know, the insight we're trying to make. And classification is done on work packages and, and not data sets. And I'll give you an example that sort of shows how bringing two data sets together could drastically change the, the risk profile of, of, of some data. Um, but sometimes also even the question we ask can, can do that. If we're trying to infer some culturally sensitive attribute, um, say a disease that has a stigma in society, then even though that attribute isn't present obviously in the data sets that we're bringing in, the fact that we are trying to infer it could, could you know, increase the risk of harm to individuals with that data set released. But here's, here's a sort of classic example, and this, this has happened in reality in both the US and Australia. You take some relatively well anonymized and pseudonymized health data. So maybe you've got the name of the hospital, maybe you've got the hospital's location. You sort of smear out the age of the, the, the patient so that you've got lots of people in individual buckets. You have the gender of the patient, the ethnicity. Maybe you've got the day of the visit, or it might even be the week if you don't have enough patients. But the idea is you've got lots of people who sort of look the same on the properties that are most close to identifying them. And then you have the health record of each patient underneath. Now, on its own, that's fine, but if you then combine it with some data from, say, local newspapers that are reporting that Joe Bloggs was in a car accident and went to hospital and needed to have his lung repaired, or you know, Fred had a heart attack last Tuesday on Dartmouth Road, um, or sort of Mary was visiting her sick daughter in hospital, then suddenly you've got some very identifiable information that combined with the timing and the location might allow you to kind of identify a single record in, in, the, in the health record. And one of the really interesting sort of questions when thinking about this sort of problem is, do we need, you know, do we work with a common threat model? You know, is it, do we have to be protective against the information that's known to everyone? Or do we have to worry about people who have more specific information? So perhaps if you're famous, you might have a paparazzi following you all the time, and then knowing that you're, you know, and they might know the exact time you ended up in hospital, and you might be identifiable from here. Maybe that is a problem that we have to worry about. Is it a problem if the person who drops you to hospital can identify your health record in the data set, especially if they're not a researcher? You know, so, so, so this is all sort of worst case. What if it gets out in the internet? Um, if your neighbor sees you getting picked up by an ambulance, is, is, that, is that a problem? And, and these are the sorts of nuances that don't always have a single common answer, but they're part of the comfort discussion we have with, with the folks who are responsible for people's data. And we center this conversation around basically five tiers. And sort of tier naught is, is at the bottom. It's publicly available, open information. You cannot get sort of less risky than that. It's already out there on the internet. Um, Importantly, it's out there legally and ethically on the internet. Just because you find something on the internet doesn't sort of make it tier naught from an ethics perspective, even if a large amount of the harm is already realized. Um, tier one is, again, quite low risk. Um, so it's often very sort of low risk commercial data or, or very sort of agglomerated personal data. And in tier one, often the primary concern is that the research team don't want to publish their data. They, they will eventually publish their data, but they don't want to publish it until they've got their publications and other outputs. And generally speaking in our model, the decision on whether to release that data, while is an agreement between the data provider and, and the research team, is, is usually delegated to the lead of the research team. And tier two is where it starts to get kind of more sensitive. And most of the data that we deal with at the Turing is tier two. We talk here about strongly pseudonymized data or perhaps data that's been synthesized from sensitive data. And, and that's a really difficult thing for us to judge uh, as to whether it, that data is actually safe and certainly for us to um, persuade data providers is. Um, or maybe there's you know, sort of generally high commercial or legal risk. And so we need to ensure that this data doesn't leave the environment and that there are clear processes for what data can. Um, tier three is, is sort of data that's either 
we're more concerned is sort of less protected. So if it got out on the internet, that you know, in combination with other data, it might be more re-identifiable. So data that's weakly pseudonymized, maybe we've got a lot of indirect identifiers still in there. Maybe there are data sets we know are out there that would make, you know, when combined with this data set would make re-identification easier. Um, maybe this data is of interest to sort of, let's say, resource constrained adversaries, so individuals or, or, or small groups. And then tier four, and there may well be categorizations above this, tier four is basically everything we're a bit scared of at the moment at the Institute. And this is either personal data that has a really high consequence if it is re-identified. So that could cause harm to someone's safety or uh, harm you know, to, their, to their health. So you could think about the location of people who are in a, a shelter for you know, sort of abuse victims or something like that, even if that data was strongly anonymized. You'd want to be really careful about how you handle that. Or data, you know, we, we do have a project on, on modern slavery where, we, where we're sort of looking at it's relatively public data, but it's still sort of, you know, the, 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 the sort of harm is, is sort of very real. Um, or perhaps this is data that's of interest to a more well-resourced adversary like a nation state or, or a large hacker group or something like that. So at the Turing for tier one and tier naught, we say a TRE is optional, but we do support it and primarily because when we do our data study groups, we have these 70 people. Some of the uh, studies will be in tier two, some will be in tier one, some might even be tier naught, and we want to provide a, a sort of common, least supportable user experience. Um, for tiers two and tier three, we require a TRE and it's supported by our data safe haven. And for tier four, obviously a TRE is required, but we don't currently support it with our combination of governance and infrastructure at the Turing. So when we think about these sensitivity tiers, this is sort of what forms the basis of our discussion. And what I'll do now is take you through sort of the process of, of how we make those decisions about where a tier, you know, where a particular work package sort of falls. Um, this is a sort of high level summary of our sort of process and the types of things we consider are, are um, uh, hang on, let's see if this works. Yep, will the project generate personal data? If we're generating personal data, there's no way for us to you know, sensibly claim that we can't re-identify people. Um, will any of the inputs be personal data? And if they are, is it already publicly available legally and ethically? Is it pseudonymized? If it's pseudonymized, you know, for us that means we as the research team and as the institute don't have a way to trivially reverse the anonymization, but perhaps the source data provider does, but we've got that organizational separation. Um, is it really impossible to re-identify? And if it's not, you can't end up in tiers nor or tiers one. If it's sort of merely difficult to re-identify, you're gonna end up in tier three or tier four. Um, if the risk is relatively low, if it's disclosed, you end up in tier two. Um, if there's a substantial threat to safety, you end up in tier four. Um, and the only way to really get to tier naught is the data is already open um, and there's no sort of commercial or legal uh, sort of things to worry about. And these only really come into play sort of when you've already said the data is not personal. So um, for us, sensitivity classifications by consensus, and there's three sort of interested parties in this discussion, and they all have to agree. And if they don't, then, well, well we generally talk until we do, or we think very carefully about whether we accept the data or we you know, default to the higher tier. So there's a project investigator, and this, you know, this person, although they're trained and although they are, you know, aware of the sensitivities of handling sensitive data and they're on our team, um, you know, they do have an interest in being able to answer the research question with the data um, and in, you know, reprodu you know, good practice like reproducibility and open openness. Uh, we've got the data provider representative. Uh, so this is the, someone from the organization who's holding that data on behalf of the data subjects or the company whose commercial sensitive data it is. And their primary interest is in protecting the subjects of that data or protecting the commercial sensitivity of the data. And that is delegatable for some things, especially egress. Um, but for ingress, for that, you know, the data that comes in, it's, it's always, always uh, the, the, someone from that organization itself. And then there's the a referee from us as the Turing running the safe haven uh, you know, because you know, we have an interest in not being on the front page of the Daily Mail. Uh, uh, and we want to you know, ensure that, especially for higher tiers, that we've got this kind of independent expertise on 
what does anonymous really mean? You know, what kind of techniques are and aren't as robust in terms of providing you know, safer data or safer outputs? And we run this process for every time data comes in and every time something goes out. And it's a slightly lighter weight process for going out. And that's often where the data provider's role uh, is delegated to somebody within the Turing, but not on the research team. Um, so, yeah, the next part of what the data safe, and safe haven is, is, is the infrastructure that, that kind of supports our governance. And largely, that's a set of technical controls uh, that are sort of mapped to our tiering model. So this is quite a, a, a sort of busy slide, but I'll sort of go through it in a, in a, in a bit of a structured way. But uh, we sort of, for each tier, have a set of sort of technical controls we can turn on or off or tune up or down. So for tier autumn one, there's very few of these. You could get, just go configure some normal Azure resources in a sensible way, and we would be comfortable with that. And we do provide some guidance on how to do that. And there are restrictions on the type of uh, cloud resource that we currently support within uh, the safe haven. So if you opt for a safe haven, you don't have access to the full suite of capabilities. But generally, tin auto one, you can connect from anywhere. You can access the internet. Uh, you can use your own device to access the remote desktop. You can connect directly via SSH. You can copy and paste between the remote desktop and your own desktop. Um, to have a user added to the project, access the data is just the project manager decides. And for data classification, it's the investigator and the data provider representative, but the data provider representative almost always delegates that to, to someone who is, can be more closely in the loop. So tier two is kind of, I guess, where controls really start to come in. And I'm, I'm just going to cover in blue the things that are unchanged from uh, before. So the big changes here are that we only allow you to even knock on the door to log into the remote desktop from an approved institutional network. And it, you know, the approved networks can, can be tuned on a pro per project basis. Um, all of the resources are isolated in a virtual network and can't access the internet. You know, there's a few safe paths out for software updates, there's a few uh, safe paths out for ways of sort of safely getting access to a constrained set of packages that have been pre-approved. Um, you can only connect to the remote desktop. There's no way to get data in or out except through the ingress and egress process. And at this point, the referee starts to get involved in decisions, certainly about data ingress. Uh, we because there is no way for the research team to directly move data in or out, we start using what we call our sort of high secure um, technical path to get data in. Um, but that's always gated by our ingress and egress reviews. Um, the investigator can say what software runs. Um, and we make available a full set of package mirrors for Python and R, and we'd like to do others. Um, and in fact, in reality, those are often at tier two proxies, so we've, we've figured out a way that that's a, a, a reasonable safety trade-off for us to ensure that the proxy can only access the upstream repositories. It allows you to access all of them, so if the proxy's sort of compromised, all that happens is you can access the upstream repositories directly, but all of the data you could access, all of the packages are the same. Uh, and for software that's not supported by the package mirrors or proxies, there's this sort of airlock mechanism very similar to how we bring data in. Um, then in tier three, again, the blue is unchanged. We start to require certain things of mostly the physical location. So, so, so we require you to act, connect from an approved access controlled environment. Um, we require you to use a device that's managed in per project. That might be a Turing managed device. It might be managed by a partner university or someone else that we trust. And we only allow access from more restricted networks that we know are only available in those medium security locations. We require a bit more approval of users coming in. The data provider has to prove those. Uh, and we require a bit more approval of software that comes in so that we got that kind of expert view on whether software represents a, a risk or not. And generally speaking, we will default deny packages. There'll be a, a common core that we'll recommend is available. Uh, and individual projects can add to that, um, but it's a sort of project tunable control. And then we don't support tier four, but if we did, this is kind of what we think would have to change. I think most of the controls are pretty much the same, but the key one is you we think 
based on conversations with people who do work with such data, that you want to ensure that people connecting to the remote desktop are doing so from a room that at least for a period of time is dedicated to that project, or at the very least share, you know, other people who are working on equally sensitive data. Uh, and while the sort of subset of packages, approved packages, you know, as a concept hasn't changed, the chances are that the subset of packages allowed will be significantly smaller. So, again, we support tier 0 and 1 in the safe haven, but if you just set up as you're sensibly, you can get similar protections and much more usability, so we don't generally recommend it, except when we do our data study groups. Uh, tier 2 and Tier 3 is kind of where, where the real meat of it is. Uh, this is where we you know, require a secure environment and it's supported by our safe haven. And Tier 4, you know, we don't yet have a use case for that. If anyone here does, we'd be really keen to talk to you to understand that a bit more. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about a bit of the architecture, how we kind of define or, or look, you know, what the safe haven looks like. And um, it's got sort of three main sort of components sort of cloud-based connection to what's Azure Active Directory, which is Azure's kind of default built-in identity manager. And the key thing there is to allow self-service user account activation and sort of management of things like password resets, multi-factor multi authentication, and so on. We've got a shared management tier where we do our user management, where admins can come in and configure things. Uh, and we've got some common resources I'll talk a little bit about later. And then we have these isolated per project secure research environments where all of the things that can be accessed by an individual project and all of the data associated with an individual project with an individual project live. So these next two slides are quite busy, but I'm going to highlight things so hopefully they'll make sense. Um, within the shared management area, we have these sort of two elements of user management. We manage users inside the environment, but we mirror them up to the uh, uh, cloud-based uh, Active Directory, so that some of those self-service uh, things work. Um, we're looking at removing the need to have these sort of local uh, deployed uh, machines for user management and do all of our management safely in the cloud. Um, the, there's a secure route for administrators, administrators uh, to access the environment, to manage users and, and, and configure access and so on. Um, all Outbound communications go through this firewall. Uh, I, I see that some of the orange lines don't quite reflect that, but basically every orange line goes through that firewall if it ends up at the internet. Uh, and primarily the only things that sort of we allow out there are no and update servers, um, uh, signatures for sort of our antivirus and so on, and some logging and monitoring so we know what's going on. But that again is safely within the bounds of our, our management layer. Uh, and to ensure that these proxies and mirrors for packages can only talk to their upstream repositories. And then the other big thing that we don't reproduce for every environment is the proxies and, and the mirrors. Um, because tier two has no, no restricted list, we use a shared proxy for all tier two environments. And for tier three environments, we'll set up either an independent proxy or a uh, independent set of mirrors, depending on how skittish and how the data provider is and how sensitive the data is. And the key main difference there is restricting to a subset of packages is in the proxy, means if the proxy's breached, you can connect to the whole set of packages available from the upstream repository. With the mirrors, we have a, an air gap between an internal set of mirrors and an external set of mirrors, and we only sync the packages uh, across that air gap that have been approved for that. Uh, environment. And then this is what each individual secure research environment looks like for each project. Um, so a bit in the middle is how the user gets in. It's the controlled access via password, multi-factor authentication, ensuring they're connecting from an approved, uh, well, an approved network uh, and um, having that remote desktop uh, connection. And at the moment we support either the open source Guacamole remote desktop or Microsoft's uh, remote desktop server. Uh, the kind of reason everyone's here is, is to do their data analysis and say so we support uh, effectively an unlimited number of data analysis machines and those can be scaled up and down in size. They can be changed from GPU to CPU or large memory to, to, to kind of um, large, GPU, uh, large CPU sort of configurations. 
Um, we've got a range of options for data, so different database servers, uh, different uh, file storage, and uh, we've got a set of collaboration services. So the main one is GitLab, so that people can collaborate on uh, coding their data and do things like pull requests and other uh, is issue discussions and so on. Uh, CodyMD, which is the open source version of HackMD, which is a uh, markdown-based uh, collaborative editing, uh, text writing, uh, and uh, CoCalc, which is collaborative coding. And there's this one little area in the corner that I just wanted to highlight in case people got worried, which is the only time uh, machines can access the internet is at the point of first deployment. So if we're deploying a new analysis machine, we want to make sure it's up to date with antivirus. We want to make sure its software is up to date. And we want to make sure that any software that needs to be installed, not from the package repositories that's been approved for that environment is installed. So all that happens in a, a kind of isolated area where it can connect to the internet, but can't be connected to from the internet. And when that update's happened, it's moved within the environment and can never again connect to the internet. Um, and then just before I sort of move on to the community aspect of, of what we're doing, I wanted to talk a little bit about what using the, the safe haven looks like. So users uh, have to sort of authenticate and connect to this remote desktop and the remote desktop is hosted in browser. Um, so it's entirely sort of, the, the remote desktop's running entirely on the sort of secured environments and the combination of the browser and the gateway remote desktop server are you know, enforcing all of the controls such as you know, lack of you know, the inability to copy and paste or connect to local storage or local printers and so on. And they have to connect using password and multi-factor authentication from a, from a known IP address range. They've got no internet access from the secure search environment at tiers two or above. No copy and paste between the secure search environment and the user's computer, again at tiers two and above and the only way data can be accessed is through the SRE, except that, you know, again, at tiers two and above. Um, and we talked you know, at the beginning that one of the key things for us was supporting all of the software and the types of machine that we needed to do effective data science at the scales that we were. And a key thing for us was that we maintained access to some relatively fully featured data science capabilities. So we have a range of data science tools pre-installed so that they can uh, work offline. Uh, we use proxies or mirrors to provide controlled access to uh, Python and our package repositories. Um, and we have a, a, both a governance and, and sort of technical approach to uh, installing additional software as agreed by each project. Uh, and then finally, we have that ability to change the scale or the type of the compute you know, as, as to suit the needs of the project um, across its life cycle. And that sort of life cycle is Almost all aspects from the technical side are, are controlled by code. So we, we take a software-defined infrastructure or infrastructure as code approach. So project secure research environments and, and the management layer itself are deployed reproducibly from configuration files. And that built, bakes in a lot of defaults for a particular uh, tier. And so mostly what you just need to do is say it's this tier and you're allowed access from here. Uh, if you want to tune some of those, those are overridable on an individual uh, SRE basis. Um, data and code, they're all within that SRE. So if it's not explicitly gone through the output egress review, then it disappears when the environment does. And we use the secure data transfer directly from the provider to the safe haven. Uh, and um, all stakeholders must approve any transfer of data in or out. Um, and finally, we do some validation. So we have regular penetration tests of our deployment and we tell you which commit that, that was based on. So you'll have to do your own due diligence, but you can have relative confidence that you're starting from the position that we are, um, as long as your sort of governance matches. And we've validated our current set of infrastructure and governance against the NHS Digital Security Protection Toolkit, which is the sort of de facto standard for handling um, anonymized but uh, uh, sensitive uh, patient data. Um, and at the moment, that's, you know, that standard is it's a self you can get audited, but it's a self-accreditation, and we're working our way up to other things like Cyber Central's Plus, which actually a large part of the, DSP, the DSPT is, um, and ISA 27001. 
Okay, and lastly, and probably most importantly for us, the Safe Haven project is sort of about community and collaboration. And we see that as having three sort of key components. One is open source. So this is about ensuring that our governance and our associated infrastructure sort of capture what we want to do you know, in common and how we might do those things differently and are available in a way that is easy to, for us all to kind of reuse and adapt to our own environments and that we have a set of shared standards that we can surface what's currently a very implicit set of common requirements for trusted research environments and common or you know, accepted approaches to, to securing those and, and, and making governance decisions and make those part of that open, reusable foundation for us all to, to, to build on. Um, and that we can ensure that we can do this in an inclusive and open collaborative way so that everybody who cares about working safely with sensitive data is, is sort of represented. Those who build these environments, those who run these environments, the researchers who use them, the data providers who are responsible for you know, looking after that data, the data subjects who are represented in the data, and, and as I said at the beginning, wider society whose sort of consent we rely on to, to continue to do our work. And for us, open source is a core culture at the Turing, and we think it's critical and necessary for open, inclusive collaboration. Having said that, even in the Turing, open sourcing our code <laughs> and our processes was a bit of a discussion. Um, it's a production system. We deploy it from a publicly available commit on, on, on our repo. And, uh, you know, so we sort of worry, understandably, that that gives more information to an attacker. But it also gives more information to our community to, to just help find sort of things that could be improved. And the more people who work on it, the, the better it gets. Um, the other concern was if someone else deploys this and there's a breach and it ends up on Newsnight or the Daily Mail, is it going to be the Turing's problem? <laughs> uh, and that was a whole other set of things. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, a common thing that we found for defaulting to open for when we don't have these complexities, which is it's a lot easier to be open from the start than to, even if you plan to, retrospectively switch everything to open. And this was a big challenge for us. We basically had to run all of our documentation past legal to ensure that we weren't implicitly providing guarantees that could cause us legal troubles later. And that's really tough because it's, it's kind of changed the tone of some of what we were saying from we think this is good practice to this is what we do at the Turing. And I think a big part of what we want to do working with the wider community is to surface that community view of what good practice looks like and you know, have some sort of collective responsibility, I guess, for that. Um, and open is increasingly the expectation from both government and the wider community. So it's been explicitly recommended in several recent reviews. So the HDR UK and DARE UK white papers on trusted research environments, the Ben Goldacre review for the UK government, and the Data Safe Lives policy paper. Um, and we are now one of three open source trusted research environments. So there's us, there's the Treehoof uh, Trusted Research Environment from the University of Dundee, which was opened as part of the previous um, uh, pilot project phase with, with there, and that's based on AWS. And Microsoft have taken some of uh, what we've been doing and sort of made a version of that publicly available as the Azure TRE, which kind of represents them capturing common things that they deal with with their customers, but isn't something that they're looking to support as a community for the lead project at the moment, but we are talking to them about how we might converge our efforts there. Uh, and the other strand is sort of shared standards. And I think you know, we started off with just being open ourselves, saying, look, here's how we do things, and let's put the effort in to make both the code, the documentation, the description of our policies and processes, easy for others to adopt and to adapt, to explain where we've made certain decisions and where other people might want to make different ones. And that we explicitly collaborating with others to understand how their needs differ. And we were doing that for a year or two before we opened our, our sort of code and documentation on a sort of, I guess, a talk to us and you know, we'll be a sort of open beta sort of thing. And we've had others pilot, either pilot our infrastructure itself or uh, take some of uh, our, our ideas and adopt them for their own infrastructure. 
And what we're trying to do now is sort of move from this being a, a sort of Turing project to being a community product, you know, something that we all sort of have equal ownership of. Um, or more precisely, we want there to be at least one of these, you know, and if it, you know, we're quite happy for it to be ours, but if the right thing is that we sort of end up with one on Azure, one on AWS, one that can be deployed locally, you know, that would be fine too. And throughout all this, we've been engaging with the wider community in, in sort of any of the structured opportunities that we've had through either Dare UK, the Safe Data Access Professionals Network, which is a group of people who run uh, TREs, uh, more recently, the NHS's Secure Data Environment Initiative, so there's a, a national SDE, but also probably a half a dozen or so, maybe more, uh, subnational TREs. So I think there's still no broad consensus as to what the one true trusted research environment looks like anywhere. And I think that's part of the work we haven't done as a community to, to say what, what do we all agree is kind of musts in terms of principles, what's kind of same ways to, to implement those, you know, what might differ elsewhere. Um, uh, and most recently, we, we, we co-founded with Dundee this Research Software Engineering Trusted Research Environment Working Group, um, which I heartily uh, encourage you to join if you haven't already uh, and you're interested in this area. Uh, and then finally, sort of a big focus of our coming work is going to be developing, trying to do that work of working with the wider community to surface these norms and establish a set of common requirements for trusted research environments. And that's through the sort of next phase of the Dare UK sort of driver projects. And the name of that project is Sartre. Um, so um, what are we doing to you know, walk the walk when it comes to a collaborative, inclusive community? Well, we've open sourced our trusted research environment, but we haven't just thrown the code over the fence. This is where we do our work. And when we open sourced it, a thousand tickets are now available. You know, all our history of working is there. And we welcome all kinds of contribution. Code is just one. So you know, use cases, feature requests, documentation, code, these are all sort of really, really helpful ways to sort of bring that community knowledge together and help us understand what it means to have an environment that can work in well, equally well in other contexts as in contexts that are like ours, but without having to start again, and, you know, to be able to just build enough extra into what we've got to support those. And um, we've got a research application manager who's, you know, uh, in, in conjunction with the rest of the developer team is, is outward facing, looking to support anyone who wants to engage. And this is a, a new role at the Turing that's been sort of incubated within our tools, practices and systems program, which is where this project and a lot of our infrastructure work lives. And the way I'd sort of describe these is like a product manager for research or uh, so as we look to move from a sort of project to a, a kind of community product, they're sort of playing that sort of role of understanding, I guess, product market fit. You know, what does the community need? What can we provide? Um, and or another way to think about them is if, as research software engineers, a key job of ours is to make software usable, a key part of the research application manager's role is to make sure it is actually used. So not just that it could have impact, but it, it does have impact. Um, we, as I said, we co-established this with RSE Trusted Research Environment Working Group, which had its first meeting as a satellite event at the RSE conference last year. We've had our second meeting virtually just before Christmas, and our next one will be in uh, March. And it looks like this is going to be adopted by DARE as, as the sort of community engagement path for the, the project that we're doing, which, as I'll talk in a minute, is, is part of a wider set of projects. Um, so this, the focus here is primarily for those sort of building and running TREs to actually work together and make their work more than the sum of its parts. But anyone who's interested in sort of more broadly in TREs is very welcome to come along. But there are also other, other groups for that, like the Safe Data Access Professionals Network, which is a lot about sharing the challenges and the practices of actually running and supporting a safe haven. Uh, and then finally, there's this next phase of Dare UK uh, projects that they're calling driver projects. So our project is looking to collate these common requirements for trusted research environments, and other projects will focus on federation across environments and uh, semi-automated output checking. And so what's our focus for the coming year? Well, it's primarily around determining these common reference requirements. And as I said, this is a Dare-funded project. We're doing it with Dundee, UCL, and a few others. 
We're going to compare three existing open source trusted research environments. We're going to capture common principles and requirements at a high enough level to be, to, to, to be common, but uh, we're going to capture community accepted ways to meet these requirements. And we're going to then evaluate these open source TREs against those. And we don't expect to have a perfect match. And so the last bit we'll do in this is to incrementally improve each of those to be somewhat closer to alignment. Just, and that sort of will prove out the model of working together, you know, even on sort of different environments in order to sort of work towards a common, a common standard. And just before I end, I'd like to stress that this has been a real team effort. You can see the current core team there on the left. But over the past four and a half years, a much larger set of contributors from across the Turing and beyond have been really key to making this project a success. Um, and then I'll finish with just a call to get involved. So you can email us at you know, generally trusted research at turing.ac.uk. If you want to sort of get more on the technical front, safe haven devs at turing.ac.uk. If you just want to hear what's going on, we've got a kind of low frequency newsletter. If you want to check out the code, our data safe haven infrastructure more generally and our information governance app are available online. And then there's a couple of Slack channels, uh, one focused on our safe haven and one within the wider RSE Slack space for the Trusted Research Environment Working Group. And with that, I'll stop for questions if I haven't already blown all the time.